Hello, Dog Nation. This is Brandon Adams, the host of Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Marco's Pizza. We are going to have some fun today. You know, I, I try to be a good guy, but every, every now and then I just can't help stirring up stuff. And there is clearly something being stirred up among Florida fans about the picture of uh, Emmett Smith that by now you may have seen him wearing the UJ hat. We're going to deal with all of that today. It's our Marlowe's Tavern Tell All on a Tuesday. We're going to unearth a lot of UJ recruiting information from Jeff Sintel coming off of G Day. We are fully loaded here for the next hour. Glad you with us. Dog Nation Daily, presented by Marco's Pizza, begins right now. From DogNation.com, this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans, presented by Marco's Pizza. Here's your host, Brandon Adams. Oh, some days are just a little more fun than others. This is one of those for me. I have a huge smile on my face. If you're listening on the radio or on podcast form, you can't see me, but just know that I am beaming here, grinning from from ear to ear, based on uh, some of the reaction to what I thought was a pretty uh, interesting moment from G-Day on Saturday. And listen, we know, and by the way, it's a Marlowe's Tavern tell-all for us coming up later on on this Tuesday with Jeff Sintel. A lot of recruiting talk there. We know when it comes to these spring games that one of the main storylines is not really what happens between the white lines. The information gleaned from a spring game is more false positive than than, than anything sometimes. Really, these uh, events are, are spectacles about having fun with fans. And we talked about yesterday how much fun it was for UGA fans. And also putting a good face on a recruiting effort here, making a big push for the class of 2019-2020. And it seems like you know, all you know, reports coming in, that was a success for Georgia in that regard, that there were a lot of recruits impressed by what a UGA uh, put forth that there on G-Day on Saturday, including apparently 2020 recruit EJ Smith, uh, who you may recognize as a last name of the former Florida Gator uh, great, and I believe all-time leading rusher in the NFL. Is Emmett Smith the all-time leading rusher? I think so. Um, well, Emmett Smith was a, a former Florida great, uh, and he was in Athens on Saturday with his son EJ, and the picture we showed you yesterday in SEC Country Live, you see Kirby Smart in there in the middle, uh, Emmett Smith and his significant other on both sides of uh, Kirby there, and Emmett Smith is rocking the uh, Georgia G on the hat. If you're watching on video, you of course see this. Uh, Emmett says, had a great time today with uh, Pat Smith and uh, head coach uh, Kirby Smart, hashtag UGA, hashtag UGA football. I believe there was even uh, one social media post, and I didn't see this one personally. This is the only one I personally saw, but uh, there was one social media post where uh, Emmett and Smith even sort of referenced a hashtag commit to the G. <laughs> And Florida fans are not happy about this. We did talk about this yesterday afternoon on SEC Country Live, and here's what my partner, Mike Johnson, the former Alabama All-American, said about what it must be like to see a Florida fan, to be a Florida fan, and to see your all-time great, your revered you know, former legend, wearing Georgia colors. Here's Mike Johnson on that subject. Yeah, it's got to be a little bit of a nauseous feeling, doesn't it, for some of those Florida fans to be able to see that. And I, it's definitely an interesting dynamic, and I think, and I, I kind of love it from Emmett Smith. I've had a chance to meet Emmett Smith. I've had a chance to talk to Emmett Smith. He's a great dude, and so I kind of love it the fact that he's like, listen, all parties aside, I'm going to come to whoever is best for my yeah, son to play so football. And if that's Georgia, good for you, Emmett Smith, for being able to do that. So good for Emmett Smith supporting his son, and for the for the most part, I actually agree with Mike on that. That you know, listen, we all have favorite teams, we all have alma maters, we all all have all of that. There is something about your own children, though, that sort of supersedes any of that. So just on sort of the factual level, I kind of agree with Mike. But there is a football level on which this is very very fun, and as Mike said, nauseous feeling. I thought that was a pretty apt description from Mike. If you go to seccountry.com and you see the story at the Florida page of seccountry.com where this is discussed, that nausea. Yeah, you do see some of that from uh, Florida fans on this subject. I'm going to read here from Greg Taylor, who commented on Facebook about the picture. I almost threw up seeing Emmett Smith in that cap. Rick Gilmore says, I cannot believe Emmett Smith did that. Very disappointed. Go there with your son, but don't put on the hat. Daniel Allen Mabel, uh, really critical of uh, Emmett Smith, saying he's acted like a wing nut for a long time. So essentially, here's a Florida fan who turns on Emmett Smith simply because he's wearing the uh, the UG hat there, Jack Armstrong. And if you're a Georgia fan, you're going to love this from Jack Armstrong. On the uh, Facebook comment section for the uh, Florida Gators says, this just shows how persuasive Kirby Smart is. That's why he's recruiting so well. He even got Emmett Smith to put on the Florida hat. How about that level of dejection here uh, from, uh, from, from the uh, Florida 
Florida fans. Jill Patton says, this is just rude. Um, uh, come on, man. Now, Christian Hawkins tries to take the more high road here. He's got the gator emoji as his Facebook profile picture. He says, guys, don't overreact. I know that picture is sickening. Emmett's just being nice. He loves his gators and always will. I'm sure when he's at his house, he's not wearing all that stuff. Uh, don't forget, Tebow was wearing the Alabama gear during the recruiting process. These sites pull stuff up like this to cause reaction. Don't let it bother you. But pretty clearly, this is uh, bothering Florida fans. And you know, I, I don't mean to take a victory lap over all this kind of stuff, but when we started the Gator Hater Countdown, and we're actually in our second year of doing the Gator Hater Countdown, think about where the Georgia-Florida rivalry was when we started this deal. We When we counted down 364 days between, uh, you know, Georgia's loss to Florida in 2016 to the 42-7 win for Georgia in uh, 2017, this rivalry was in a much different place. And here we are in year two of reminding uh, Georgia fans that a good Georgia fan is a Gator hater more than anything else. And, boy, the script has really changed here. The uh, world has turned to the point now where you've got Florida fans on their own page at SECCountry.com complaining about one of their all-time greats wearing a UGA, UGA hat at Georgia's G-Day. Now, ultimately, do I think that EJ Smith is coming to Georgia? I don't even know. I don't even know really where, where he ranks right now as a 2020 recruiting priority. Georgia's obviously extended the offer and was certainly uh, intent on hosting him there uh, this past Saturday. Ultimately, does he end up at Florida? Maybe he does. And I think, you know, Emmett wearing the hat and everything else kind of all in good fun here. Eventually, the Florida fans probably forget this. Probably everybody moves on. But for now, it is kind of fun to have some fun at the uh, Gators' expense. And kind of nice to remind Florida fans that when it comes to recruiting momentum in the SEC and around the South, Georgia has something that Florida can only pretend to have. I think it only grows here towards the uh, – uh, 2019 cycle, and in EJ's year 2020, I think that's probably the uh, case as well. This is not a great time to be a Florida fan, especially when you look up at Georgia, who only seems to be getting bigger and getting better, and boy, that's a lot of fun for me to say. My name is Brandon Adams, and this is Dog Nation Daily, the daily podcast for Georgia Bulldogs fans. We are presented by Marco's Pizza, and we are glad you are with us, whether you're watching us on video, Dog Nation Facebook page, Dog Nation YouTube page, and now I'm proud to say Dog Nation on Twitter as well. As we broadcast live, simulcast on Twitter for the first time yesterday, and now, fence forth, every other day going forward, you can catch us on the uh, Dog Nation Twitter page. In fact, for those of you who are regular viewers to the uh, Facebook uh, viewing, the YouTube viewing, how about you hop over to the Dog Nation Twitter account just for a couple of minutes, help us do a little beta testing. Just check it out, drop some comments in the uh, comment section, and we'll see if we can make sure that's all working the way that y'all want it to. Uh, Dog Nation on Twitter, now 10 a.m. live each and every day. Also, uh, the radio at noon on Athens Sports Radio 960 The Ref. We love being in the classic city on the radio and podcast form wherever podcasts are found. Apple Podcasts, Android devices, SoundCloud, the world famous dognation.com. We're really glad you have found Dog Nation Daily presented by Marco's Pizza. And speaking of Marco's Pizza, right now Marco's got a great offer for you. They want you to meet the boss, the boss of all cheese pizzas. I've been telling you about this for a while. And I like this for two reasons. First of all, I love just you know, five cheeses blended together, melted together on that authentic Italian crust. And I love the price right now. The big cheese for Marco's is just $10.99 for an extra large. But you've got to act fast. This offer just for a limited time. So go to Marco's.com, find the Marco's nearest you, and you can be enjoying the big cheese for $10.99 there at the uh, closest Marcos to you. Uh, we'll have Jeff Sintel coming up to uh, talk some recruiting with him in just a moment. Looking forward to uh, doing that today. I also want to deal with the subject here for a couple of minutes that I think many of you were probably glad about something that Chip Tower said on Dog Nation Daily yesterday because I think for many of you, Chip's words uh, reflect what many of you have been trying to tell me for a while. Some of y'all know that I've maybe expressed a little bit of concern that if you want to use national championship level as your standard for all the various position groups at Georgia, there, there is one for 2018, or at least one for 2018, that I'm saying, you know, you know, is that a national championship level group? And for me, that's wide receivers. I, I, I have some questions about that. And when I mentioned those two chip towers yesterday, he responded by saying, for him, those questions don't really exist. And as I said, this echoes the feelings that I've been getting from many of you. So you were probably glad on Dog Nation Daily yesterday when Chip Tower said this. I don't really share your concern there. Actually, the uh, wide receiver core has been one of the areas that I've been uh, positively reinforced all spring. And uh, you got to think, I mean, you didn't see Terry Goblin on Saturday. So Terry Goblin is the heart and soul of that unit, and he didn't play. And I think Terry Goblin 
has all America capability, I, in all honesty. And I think Riley Ridley does as well, and McCole Harmon is really special. So a couple things there. I love his description of Terry Gowan saying that he is the heart and soul of that Georgia wide receiver core, and in some ways maybe the heart and soul of the entire team. I think that's a good description from Chip Towers. And, you know, I, I couldn't help but think, and I don't want to overhype here, but I, I couldn't help but think that listening to Chip during an off season describe Terry Gowan as a potential All-American it reminded me last year of doing some videos and some conversations with Chip Towers when he was calling Roquan Smith a potential All-American. At the time, Roquan was just coming off a 95-tackle season in his sophomore year of uh, 2016. It was not really a very logical leap to say, and Roquan Smith's going to be an All-American. It obviously turned into that much more. He was the Butkus Award winner for 2017, but Chip has been accurate with his All-American predictions in the past, and he says, hey, it could be potentially that kind of season for uh, Georgia wide receiver uh, Terry Godwin. I-, I guess that remains to be seen, and you know, my skepticism isn't completely erased just by hearing uh, Chip there in that regard, but it is important to note that when Kirby Smart talked wide receivers after Saturday's G-Day, you know, you just heard Chip there reference referencing some of the names we already know, guys like Terry Gowan and uh, McCole Hardman. It was Kirby who was impressed with some of that next-level group, some of those young guys looking for their chance to step up and earn more in playing time. He really felt like that spring, not just G-Day, but the spring overall was a good time of growth for them. Confidence gained for kind of a specific reason here. Here's Kirby Smart on that. Every time I talk to y'all, I talk about the receivers being a little head, and I think that showed really from the standpoint of those development guys. I think Tyler Simmons this spring has taken, man, he's a lot of strides, and I think it comes from confidence in special teams. J.J. Holloman has taken strides. It's like those two guys, Matt Landers a little bit, they've really like grown up. And I throw Jason in that, because Jason's not youthful like them, but he gained confidence through special teams. So those wideouts gained confidence all spring. That was very typical of what happened in practice a lot of times, they're hungry. They want to play. So they know to get in front of Miko, Terry, and Riley, what do I got to do? I got to go compete and go catch the ball. And I thought those guys did a good job, really good job of being competitive and doing that. And they're probably a little bit ahead of, you know, our DBs are a little bit more drained. On our Facebook Live broadcast, Jay Wise, who's a great commenter, a couple of minutes before I just played that Kirby audio said, nobody's mentioning Tyler Simmons right now, who seemed to be Justin Fields' favorite target. I think he just might be a big surprise this year. Well, you just heard Kirby Smart mention Tyler Simmons in connection with guys like J.J. Holloman. He also mentions Jason Stanley there and others, uh, Matt Landers, but he does mention Tyler Simmons, and I can't help when I think about Tyler Simmons, think back to what uh, Terrence Edwards said about Simmons back at Dog Nation Appreciation in March. Terrence was there. Terrence had been working during the offseason with both Simmons and Trey Blunt, had some good things to say there. So pretty clearly, when you think about the Georgia wide receiver core, the one thing that you know with certainty is there are plenty of potential names here. This is not a, this is not a group lacking in depth. There are a lot of good recruits over the last three cycles, and really, I guess, maybe four cycles, that, uh, th- that, that fit into this group right now. I think what remains to be seen, though, is from this long list of potential names, is there a true, honest-to-goodness, consistent playmaker that emerges? On Saturday, the results on that subject may be a little bit mixed, given the fact that there were maybe some opportunities for more big plays in the passing game that, for whatever reason, just weren't hauled in or did not turn into a completions. And Kirby Smart did speak on that subject a bit on Saturday as well. Wow. You know, I thought they probably would have hit some bigger plays, but, you know, Riley has the one in the end zone. I think he probably should make that play. He makes that catch. He made it later in very similar situations. So I think that's one of those that if you hit that one, it may, the whole game may be different if you catch that ball because he got behind Tyreek. But um, the guys competed hard. Biggest difference, guys, is when the run threat's not there, the pass rush dominates and it protects your coverage. When you start running the ball a lot and you play action, it's when you get in trouble. Well, that that's the part that's not really fair to the offense because you're sitting there throwing the ball a lot more and they're teeing off on you in pass rush. I think that what 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 Kirby says there is uh, is accurate. That it's a little hard to judge the passing game overall for Georgia on Saturday, just given the fact that you didn't have that sort of extra dimension of the uh, running game, something to sort of keep the defense honest. This was a game where I think both sides, offense and defense, for both the red team and the black team, knew that was George, that Georgia was going into this game to do a, uh, a a whole lot of a whole lot of passing, and therefore there was a uh, an opportunity to kind of step up and defend that probably a little bit more than you uh, typically would have in a, in a normal situation. But still for me, the overall takeaway here is 
in the big moments of 2018, and by the way, Chip Towers on Dog Nation yesterday, we may talk about more, more of this later on in the week, and, 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 uh, that, that Georgia may throw the ball more in 2018. Well, in the big moments of 2018, it's about more than just making the sort of simple safe throws. It's about also extending a defense vertically, you know, you know keeping, keeping a, uh, a defense honest. Is that something that Georgia's going to be able to do with its wide receiver core this season? I'm honestly interested to see how that uh, plays out, but I think a lot of Georgia fans will take some comfort in what you just heard from Chip Towers a moment ago, that one of the guys that was not a factor really on Saturday because he's been dealing with some stuff, Terry Godwin, we know what he's capable of doing. He's been you know, at Georgia now for a few years, made the uh, dynamic catch against uh, Notre Dame, been seemingly a, a guy that's sort of grown in terms of uh, his leadership role and, his, and his, his, his ability to contribute now over the course of his UGA career. It sounds like Chip Towers is expecting big things from Terry Godwin and that's going to uh, put a smile on a lot of UGA fans' faces. By the way, one more comment I want to mention here before we uh, bring on Jeff Sintel for our um, our uh, Marlowe's Tavern tell-all. Kanan Bird on our YouTube comment section, going back to the Emmett Smith hat earlier, said, the hat he's wearing looks brand new. He probably only bought it for just that one day, but I still like that the Gators hate it. It makes me love it. And Kanan, that is obviously the way I feel on that, too. I think that's well said and funny. Florida fans mad about Emmett Smith's hat, and, well, that's all it takes for Georgia fans to be happy here on this Tuesday. We're glad you're with us on uh, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Marco's Pizza. We'll have more of your comments on all of our video platforms coming up later on. And for those of you listening on the radio and the uh, podcast, we're glad to have you with us as well. Hope you enjoy Jeff's Intel right now. It's our Marlowe's Tavern Tell All. We do it every Tuesday, and we'll do it right now. From Athens and across the SEC or wherever the recruiting trail may lead, here's a DogNation.com insider. And, of course, Marlowe's reminds you to become an insider. Text the word Marlowe's. That's simply the word spelled, M-A-R-L-O-W-S. The 24242, no apostrophe for that. And you become a Marlowe's Insider, and you can get all the up-to-date special offers at the Marlowe's closest to you. Once again, text the word Marlowe's, M-A-R-L-O-W-S, to 24242. You can become a Marlowe's Insider today. Jeff Sintel, good morning. Uh, I will give you the uh, pleasantries today coming off a, I think, successful G-Day for your coverage, also for Georgia's recruiting efforts. And uh, we'll look forward to getting some information from you on that right now. How are you doing today? Brandon, I, I'm great, and um, I guess I want to start things off with uh, I'm going to come right at you, Brandon, with no pleasantries. Wow! You know, if your son wanted to go play quarterback in Florida, and that was his best offer, you would probably go, let him go to Florida, especially if he really wanted to go to Florida. True or false? Yeah, it is true, and I, I kind of alluded to this a moment ago. When it is your own kids, you sort of break some rules that you didn't think you'd ever break. Now, I don't think I have to worry about that. You know, based on the genes that my son inherited, I don't know that he's going to be a Division One quarterback, so I probably won't have to face the same decision that Emmett Smith did. But it is kind of nice to see the Florida fans squirming, uh, squirming over it, even if it's a somewhat justifiable thing for a dad to do for his son. Yeah, I mean, like, we're talking Florida here now. We're not talking about Tennessee or what's going on up there now. I mean, we're talking Florida. So uh, maybe, maybe Charlie could go play in Florida, but not the Volunteers in the current <laughs> shape they're in right now. That may be about right. By the way, speaking of Georgia-Florida battles, the one that may be more relevant for this upcoming recruiting cycle is the one going on with Derek Rambo Hunter, who's obviously said some really good things about Florida. You've chronicled all of that. Hunter was also at G-Day on Saturday. I believe that was his first visit ever to Athens. And the quotes that he gave you, boy, he was really raving over it. And if you just sort of isolate those quotes, well, you probably think, well, that means that Hunter is now a strong Georgia lean and a uh, guy that Georgia be favored to sign. But there's more context with than that, as you know. He visits Clemson over wow. the weekend, too. Uh, you know, he said a lot of things in the past uh, about Florida that were just as glowing. How much do you read into the overwhelming level of praise that Hunter, to you at Dog Nation, uh, gave about his uh, visit to UGA over the weekend. Yeah, Brandon, you we got to go uh, behind the scenes with that uh, with that notebook or that story right there because I wanted to add the appropriate levels of context to to Derek Hunter's decision because Derek Hunter, he, let's face it, he is an incredible interview. He's charming. He's engaging. He could probably his you know quotable percentage is probably. 50% out of everything he says probably would, would go in a recruiter's notebook or a recruiting story. But I, I wanted to lead uh, that story this week, no matter what he said about how great things were at Georgia. And, I mean, it looked like, Brandon, you were inside his head at times when he was talking about the Georgia Bulldogs <laughs> back and forth. And uh, he thought it was a video game. He loved the guys with the trophy, all that 
you know, glowing praise that makes people think, oh, my gosh, she's ready to suit up right now. Uh, but I had to balance all that. You know, the Florida thing was a storyline I wanted to wait and write about the compare contrast between Florida and Georgia, Sal Sinceri and Trey Scott, when he had the chance to, to have seen both programs, and that's why I let off a lot of that material. I also made sure that Clemson was also dropped into this equation as well because he called it dope. He took the slide down from the weight room on the fourth floor all the way down to the first floor. I uh, thought Todd Bates was a genuine man that, that is now recruiting him as well. And he said he's going to come up to Georgia a lot, but he also says when he makes a trip to Georgia, he's going to squeeze in that Clemson trip as well. So there's a lot of things that are looked at with Rambo Hunter, but uh, Rambo does really feel that certain type of way about Georgia, and he can see himself fitting in with the, with the locker room, trying on that number seven jersey, and Nolan Smith is definitely in his ear. Eric Moody on our Facebook comment section says, what's a bigger need right now, defensive backs or defensive line? I don't know that Georgia has a bigger need right now for 2019 class than its defensive line. And, Jeff, that's one of the reasons why this Rambo conversation is so relevant here because uh, of other names like you mentioned, you know, uh, Nolan Smith trying to entertain him a bit this weekend too. Georgia needs guys that do what a Derek Rambo Hunter does, correct? They need Derek Hunters. They need about three, four more Rambos on the defensive line, those big – Block eating can get can get to the quarterback, nicing penetrators type guys like that. Rambo Hunter definitely fits that bill. Um, power lifter loves lifting weights. Uh, one of the things he he told me, <coughs> I thought was very interesting and very real. He, he says so many interesting printable things, but uh, when you're when you're covering a, a, yeah, an unofficial visit, you're covering a game day visit for a recruit. You know they parade them out and they watch pregame practice pre-game and warm-ups, and that's a good time to get a lot of the photos with the interaction with the coaches or just how they're kind of sizing up the, the, the stadium and the atmosphere and the vibe. Well, there was no six-foot, six-and-a-half, 285-pound dude with dreads near that sideline at all, so it was really hard to get photos of Rambo. But then when he let, he let me know that the reason he wasn't on the sideline is because he can't stand being that close to a game <laughs> and on the field and around all that energy uh, unless he gets the chance to play. He says he gets too wired up when he's that, that close to the field. And that right there is an, an, an indicative tell about the type of player and the type of passion he will have on the field for whichever helmet he puts on eventually. And he's going to make a cut-down decision tomorrow, I believe, and he's going to go down to eight schools. And obviously you don't need to be mind readers to know that Florida, Clemson, and Georgia will be among those eight. Yeah, that's well said. Uh, let me talk about another guy uh, with uh, State of Florida ties, and that's Trey Sanders, the number one running back in the country of the class 2019 from IMG uh, Academy. He is a obviously a high school teammate here of uh, Nolan Smith. He was at Georgia on Saturday. I thought it was significant that he referenced the elite crop of offensive linemen that Georgia's recruiting. This is, of course, to you at dognation.com. That's the kind of thing that could help Georgia, I think, with a guy like uh, Sanders, the fact that it's recruited so well along the offensive line. Do you think it's significant that Sanders, who's a big priority for a school like Alabama, was at Georgia instead of the Tide in Tuscaloosa over the weekend? That was significant. Uh, I think, uh, you know, I want to introduce two brand new phrases uh, to the lexicon here on the daily with our recruiting stuff, Brandon. Number one, the first phrase is follow the visitors on the visit. And what you can do with all these visitors on those unofficial visits, especially on game day, is you can watch who those visitors hang with. And Derek Hunter sat with Trey Sanders for most of the game in the stands. And then also Trey Sanders hung out with Nolan Smith, uh, Legend Cavazos, Jermaine Burton, Jaden Hazelwood, guys like that. These are new names that uh, folks learned a little bit about last night on the, uh, on the Before the Hedges recruiting show. But the other phrase I got for you is everybody remembers that ad slogan about dudes getting a Dell. Uh, well, it might be Dell's getting another dude when it comes to <laughs> running back recruiting at the University of Georgia. Uh, people are going to, I wrote about him yesterday. Everybody's going to say, come on, man, another five star, another nation number one running back. How is Georgia doing this? Why is Georgia doing this? Well, the common thread might be Dell McGee. Uh, Sanders has made multiple trips to Georgia, several that folks probably don't even know about. And he says every time he's at Georgia, he feels great 
about being at Georgia. He says Georgia was his second offer. They're always going to be in the running for him because that was the second opportunity he had to go play football in college and get an education. He loves the fact that there's competition there. That's not a negative for him. It's a positive. Remember, Sanders went to ING where he shares the backfield with Noah Kane anyway. Another top three running back in the country at ING. Another four or five star running back. Our, our viewers and our readers know all about Noah Kane as well. He wants that. He wants that crucible to be in. He wants to be in a in a in a room full of guys that are very good that will push each other. And he knows it will take less of a toll on his body should he go to the league because he will not be getting those 340 carry seasons a year. And he'll always hit the hit the field and hit the holes with a full tank of gas. It is uh, Jeff Sintel joining us here for our Marlowe's Tavern Tell All. We do it every Tuesday on our uh, Dog Nation Daily here. Of course, when you think about Marlowe's, I want you to think about brunch. You know, brunch is what's for breakfast and lunch, you can, and you can fall in love with Sunday brunch available every Sunday at select Marlowe's locations. You go to marlowestavern.com and get more information about which Marlowe's offer uh, the uh, brunch option. I, t- I tell you, I have been to the brunch many times before um, at uh, Marlowe's, and I love that on a, a Sunday. That is a, a great way to go there. And Jeff, to kind of keep our theme of kind of comparing Georgia and Alabama here, who both hosted spring games on Saturday, going for a moment i guess you gave us the number that overall it's georgia hosting five of the top 11 players in the country according to the 24 7 sports composite how does georgia's haul in terms of a visitor list you know define as a success in comparison to alabama which also had a a big group of uh, visitors on saturday and got a a handful of commitments here how do you compare what georgia did on saturday what alabama did did we lose jeff all right, let's uh let's see if we can get Jeff back on the phone there. Hopefully everything's okay with him. Uh, we'll we'll pull Jeff back up on there on that. I always think it's funny that we always seem to leave uh when when uh, a guess like that drops off, it always seems to be like at the moment of suspense. You know, big answer, big question. You know, kind of uh uh um you know at, at the moment of when you're really dying to find out what he says and he sort of drops off. I do believe we have Jeff Sintel back on the phone. Jeff, what I was asking is when it, when you look at the um. The, the comparison of Georgia and Alabama on Saturday, I think you gave us number five of the top 11 prospects in the country. How did Georgia do in comparison to Alabama on Saturday? Well, it was funny. Georgia got uh, Jay Hayes, uh, the graduate transfer, who just committed to Oklahoma recently when Alabama was expecting him. They got Clay Webb, but I don't know how much of a tell that is because Clay Webb had been at Alabama the two previous weekends, but that did make his second straight G-Day. Uh, Clay Webb got a lot of family uh, in and around Athens and northeast Georgia. Uh, he was able to go see them, then go to G-Day, and then go to the Under Armour camp in Atlanta on Sunday. So a lot of that just made all a lot of sense from a logistics standpoint. Alabama's going to be a different beast this year. If you really want to know where Georgia's at recruiting-wise, if they're going to stake a claim for defending the number one recruiting class in the country, I think Alabama is going to be a juggernaut in the way this year. They must have picked up about six or seven recruits, I think nine recruits over the last ten days. Uh, They've now vaulted, I believe, to the number one class in the country uh, for 2019. Uh, A lot of momentum coming there with the Tide, and I think Georgia's going to have some things in the coming weeks that will match that. Uh, But Alabama's probably going to be able to sign a full load of scholarships, 25 or so in uh, 2019, and they weren't able to do so with only 19 in 2018 so that will be an interesting match race there uh i don't know if it'll quite be like war admiral and sea biscuit from that uh great horse racing movie of about uh, 15 years ago but it's going to be quite a race between georgia and alabama for the number one class in the sec the number one class in the nation and I think that will mirror a lot of things that will happen on the field this fall as well. You mentioned the Oklahoma uh, uh, commit who was there. Is that the is that the Notre Dame grad transfer defensive lineman? Is that is that who you're referencing there? Yeah, that's Jay Hayes. And I, I know I know people are kind of indifferent about Hayes. Was he a major starter at Notre Dame? Was he an impact player? Do they remember him wreaking havoc against Georgia and South Bend? Uh, but what he would be would be a depth guy. He, Georgia definitely needs defensive linemen, and it's also a case where uh, he would be a graduate transfer, and that would just be a, simply a one-year scholarship there, not a four-year scholarship there. The other thing to think about there with, um, with Mr. Hayes is he's from Poly Prep in Brooklyn. That's the same high school program which produced Isaiah Wilson, so I'm sure he's heard big things. And if anybody wants to re- research his recruitment and go back to 
when he was making his decision in 2012, Georgia was always one of his favorite schools that he was going to really pay a lot of attention to if he ever got that offer. All right, let me do a couple quick things here before we uh, let you go on our Marlowe's Tavern tell-all. You mentioned Clay Webb, the uh, center, you know, huge priority for Alabama, but he choose to be G-Day on Saturday. It sounds like you don't think there's a whole lot there necessarily, though. And, and, you know, Georgia gets the visit. Ultimately, it sounds like you don't think they win that recruitment, though. Well, Brandon, again, man, this is where Georgia's recruiting is at right now. When you, when you tell me there's nothing there, when I say Georgia's probably going to be a strong silver medal finish <laughs> and they're the best <laughs> chance at Alabama, there's definitely something there. You're talking about a school – he will visit twice. You will be talking about his school that he will give an official visit to. He's not going to make his decision until December the 20th during the early signing period. So there's definitely something there. It's just not a marriage proposal or an engagement ring or a promise ring that you would like to see from Clay Webb uh, here in April. I will tell you one thing. This one thing and not a lot of people report. He's the nation's number one center. Very good at what he does. He's been great at center for a couple of, couple of years now. But Clay Webb probably actually would rather, really rather be a guard in college than center. Of course, he wants to play right away. Of course, he wants to get on the field and help the program. But he would really rather be a guard than a center. Uh, so that's something to tuck away there as well. Hey, real quick final thing before we let you go. Brian Brazian, I hope I'm pronouncing that name correctly. You corrected us on this on Friday. Any update on Brazi's visit to Athens on Saturday? Yeah, it went well. It uh, went very well. He uh, brought – and here's the thing Brandon did know about Brazil. If he had a whole lot of family with him, it was like he had his mom, dad, both of his sisters. Uh, he brought an extended family uh, with him uh, to Athens for G-Day. There was a moment there when they were all on the sidelines and Kirby was hopping around. and It looked like he had something to do, but the minute he saw Breezy, he did an abrupt, abrupt 180, uh, came and chatted with him for a little bit, his family. Lots of smiling, back-slapping interchange was going on, and I think Brian Brzee is going to make a home, make a visit for a home game this fall. He's probably going to you're going to see him show up over the summer at a camp so we can work out for the coaches as well and see what that's like to be coached by them. I think Georgia is in a really good place right now with Brzee, especially when he's not going to make his decision for a while or even cut down his favorites for a while. But I think this is the nation's number one player in the country, and these are the sort of things that a prospect needs to do and a program needs to do to build that long-term relationship, especially when you're talking about a young man from Maryland who really needs to get acclimated to all of the elite schools that are chasing him. So I tried to impress you with the updated pronunciation. I screwed it up again. I said Brazi. It's Brazi. Is it Brazi? That's how we're saying it now? Brazi. Yeah, there you go. Jeff, thanks for your time here on the Marlowe's Tavern Tello on this Tuesday. We appreciate you being with us. Look forward to reading a whole bunch more from you at adognation.com in the days ahead. Great work on Saturday. And by the way, check out that recruiting uh, photo gallery from Saturday. If you really want to feel like you're in the moment and sort of behind the scenes with what these guys were experiencing, Jeff, a lot of photos and a lot of smiles. I thought that looked really good. Hey, two new words, guys. Remember that. Follow the visitors on the visit, and Dell's getting another dude. And, Brandon, next segment we get together, I'm going to try and include Papo and Brazi as much as possible <laughs> so you can really have a mind explosion during the middle of your program. I certainly appreciate that, Jeff. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks, guys. Let's take a look around the rest of the league. This is SEC Through. I think Neil Armstrong had a uh, better signal from the surface of the moon. But... Nonetheless, it's uh, always good to have uh, Jeff Sintel on uh, Dog Nation Daily, presented by uh, Marco's Pizza for our, um, our, our Marlowe's Tavern Tell All every Tuesday here on the uh, program. Let me get ready to remind you, by the way, coming up 3 p.m. Eastern time this afternoon, it's uh, SEC Country Live coming up on the SEC Country video channels, Facebook, YouTube, now Twitter. I am hearing from some of you on uh, like YouTube and Facebook that you've gone over to check out the Twitter feed here a little bit today, kind of get used to that. Uh, it seems like a lot of you are going to stick with your normal channel for right now, but we're glad to have the uh, Twitter feed out there for the uh, maybe the new folks who uh, may pick up on the show through Twitter that otherwise uh, would not see that. So uh, kind of nice to be able to be out there in all those uh, various uh, channels. And, you know, I mentioned SEC Country Live a, a moment ago. Um, you know, yesterday on the show, we were able to kind of play the the video that Funny Main, the the comic, he is an Alabama fan, but sort of a stand-up comedian, kind of famous for that, at least in this part of the country, he's famous for that. He uh, apparently picked up on the TV broadcast of the Alabama A-Day game 
a, a hot mic where uh, Nick Saban was caught criticizing Jalen Hurts, saying something to the effect of, you know, the third string quarterback is marching the offense right down the field by throwing the football. Hurts has been here for two years. He still can't. I mean, listen, you know, that's obviously not words that Saban intended to get out there in the public, but we sort of already knew the writing was on the wall about this anyway. That, that Jalen Hurts' days of being the Alabama starting quarterback are numbered, and that number now is probably zero. Tuatungo Vailoa was injured and not playing in the Alabama 8 day game, but his status as Alabama starting quarterback seems stronger than ever, even in a game w- in which he did not play. But here is, I believe, the issue for Alabama. Alabama is a worse football team if Mac Jones is your number two quarterback in comparison to Jalen Hurts, even though Jones probably outplayed Hurts on A day. You know, you got to stay national championship level at every position. We talked about that with Georgia and its wide receivers a moment ago. The standard for teams like Georgia and Alabama now is, are you good compared to typical national champions? Well, for Alabama, that also means having a national championship caliber backup quarterback. And Hurts may not be a national championship starting quarterback, but he's pretty dead gum good as a backup. So Saban's got a tough job here. Uh, Hurts, what's best for him is probably to transfer, but him transferring or even moving positions at Alabama I think overall makes Alabama worse. Now, I don't know that it ruins Alabama or dooms them to uh, dooms them to fail, but clearly that would be a ding on that on that you know roster that you're trying to build to repeat as national champions and uh, you know uh, rest away the SEC championship from uh, Georgia. You need all hands on deck, which includes Jalen Hurts. It's going to be a very tumultuous and interesting offseason there in Tuscaloosa. I for one cannot wait to see how that all plays out. I thought that Lauren Shude, our uh, colleague from SECCountry.com, who uh, writes for the Auburn page and an interesting take on Auburn. She was asked in her sort of, it's like a weekly mailbag. It's really like a daily question of the day type mailbag thing. You know, what are Auburn's chances of repeating as a uh, SEC West uh, champion here? And many of you are all well, well aware that I do believe that Auburn has a pretty good chance of being a top 10 team overall again uh, in, in 2018. I think Auburn's going to beat Washington and start the season. That won't impact their ability to win the West, but that's the kind of run I think they're going to go on. Ultimately, though, I think what Auburn's going to run into when it comes to difficulty is, as you all know, it's two toughest games, both in the month of November, both on the road at Georgia, at Auburn, or I should say at Alabama. And ultimately, you know, Auburn's chances of repeating as West champion, and goodness knows they'll give them another ring where they to do it. But ultimately, what's going to really hurt Auburn's chances there more than anything else is, look at this Alabama schedule for a moment. Look at you know, look at the SEC competition that Alabama is expected to play until it plays Auburn at the end of the year. You know, there's no SEC game that Alabama won't be a sizable, sizable favorite in. You know, in order for you to win the West, if you're Auburn, you need some help from Alabama to the tune of a loss. And boy, I just don't really see a conference loss there for Alabama. Now, at home, they'll be a favorite over Auburn too. That's an upset that the Tigers could pull. But you need more than just that one loss to really sort of raise your chance of winning the West. And I'm not sure Auburn gets the gift of an Alabama conference loss before the Iron Bowl. Alabama right now looks far ahead of its SEC West competition to say nothing of like third Saturday in October against a pretty miserable Tennessee team. Speaking of Tennessee, quick update here on the Tennessee quarterback situation where Jarrett Garantano does win the MVP for the uh, – for the spring game there. I forget what they call theirs. 34-7 was the final score. Garantano's team apparently running it up a bit on the other side there. And, you know, after the game was over with, you know, Pruitt tried to pay lip lip service to Will McBride still being in that competition. I think most people think that Keller Christ does, when he arrives later on this summer, arrives and eventually wins that starting job. Although I guess it is worth pointing out that a couple of the ESPN analysts were saying that Garantano's now making it harder on Christ to come in and win this job based on the way that he finishes the spring. I'm not quite sure if that's just hype or not, but that is what was said. And then one other quick final SEC story to get to here. I thought there was a pretty good piece, and this is not mocking Florida this time. This is being serious. Um, there was a pretty good piece on SECcountry.com from Ryan Young about the chances of Dan Mullen bringing in a transfer quarterback for Florida, grad transfer quarterback, and he lists, lists some of the names that could be out there, guys like Jeff George Jr. from Illinois, um, Chris Ch- uh, Chuganoff from uh, West Virginia, who I've never heard of. He does mention Jacob Park, the former Georgia quarterback. Maybe that's a long shot given Park's skill set. Mentions uh, J.J. Cosentino, who has recently been at Florida State. Maybe the most interesting name on this list, though, is um, Tucker Israel, who was just a three-star quarterback coming out of high school but has been at Clemson. 
That Clemson job seems about to be taken over by incoming freshman Trevor Lawrence, to say nothing of Kelly Bryant, who was last year's starter. Kind of an interesting idea that Florida might go graduate transfer route from a quarterback at a place like Clemson that would be running a similar offense, have a similar skill set to what Mullen wants to do at Florida. That's a, something kind of interesting to watch here over the course of the summer, and we'll make that your SEC through. And here on Dog Nation Daily, presented by Marco's Pizza, I want to turn our attention back to the Georgia Bulldogs for a moment, and I want to spend a couple minutes here on a subject that we actually dealt with around the same time yesterday in terms of Kirby Smart's desire to see more leaders, leaders step up to the Georgia program. And the point that I made yesterday was, hey, you know, you got two kinds of teams potentially this time of year. You've got talented teams with no leaders and experienced teams that have leadership maybe lack talent. And I said for me personally, give me the talented teams over the experienced teams with, you know, quote unquote leadership, you know, all the time. I Talent is that sort of limited resource that there's never going to be enough of, and that's what really is going to help you win championships. But that's not to say that I don't think leadership is important for college football and important in the SEC in particular. In fact, I think we would all say that the 2017 season for Georgia, one of the things that made it so special was the way that leaders stepped up over the course of that year and took on more of a mantle of asking for things that you would expect coaches to ask for. But coaches' messages can wear thin and grow tired over time. When those messages are coming from your colleagues, your 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 peers, other players, it's just a more significant message. And Kirby knows for 2018 that those guys who fill that role, well, they still need to step up. Some people are trying to get there. They may not quite be there as of yet. Here's Kirby Smart on that point. I'll say that there's guys that are trying. Jonathan Ledbetter is really pushing for that. Terry Godwin's trying to be vocal when he gets an opportunity. We need more guys to step up. They're just not comfortable right now in that role. And we've got a manufacturer. Lamont has tried to do some things. I think Andrew Thomas. You know, we've got a lot more guys on offense that are close to what we want than we do on defense. What I think is interesting about that is, is A, you know, some of those different names that he mentions, Jonathan Ledbetter, you know, Terry Godwin, Lamont Gilliard, a Andrew Thomas. In their own way, I sort of see them being able to maybe uh, eventually be able to take on more of this role more. Terry Godwin's a name we talked about uh, with the uh, clip from Chip Towers a little earlier in the show. If you go back to last year, you know, Godwin was apparently already so showing some leadership then because Kirby Smart praised him for helping get McCole Hardman ready to play the wide receiver position. So there's clearly some some you know leadership DNA into Terry Godwin. He was already showing that last year, even though some of the upperclassmen were maybe sort of thought of as as, as more of the likely leaders in the Georgia team. I think Ledbetter is a candidate to be a really good leader because the fact that he's going to be a really good player. I think football is a sport where where success on the field is almost a prerequisite to be a leader off of the uh, field, and I think Ledbetter is going to have the kind of season that gives him a lot of credibility with some of his Georgia teammates. And then you also mentioned a guy like Andrew Thomas, who we've sort of spoken about in that sort of leadership capacity before because Kirby's publicly challenged him to be a leader in the uh, past. Thomas is so smart and so well-spoken. He's proven that so many times, including interviews right here on a, a Dog Nation Daily, that we think eventually he'll be able to do that. But the real important takeaway here for me is, you hear Kirby Smart saying some guys are close to being there but just not quite there yet. The same thing was also true a year ago. The leaders that Georgia put on display, we didn't know this time a year ago just how good their leadership was going to become. Case in point, take a guy like Lorenzo Carter, who was clearly a leader for Georgia, but he had to grow into that role at one point in time, too. Here's Kirby Smart from a year ago as a reminder to that. I think he can improve on his pass rush. He can improve on his knowledge of the defense. But the best thing he's improved on is uh, relationship with the other players and being a leader. Hear the word improve there? His relationship with the other players being a leader. When Kirby Smart says he's improved in that regard, the obvious takeaway here is that's a facet of Lorenzo Carter's skill set that maybe wasn't there at one point in time in in you know, 2016 or 2015 in his early days in the Georgia uniform. Maybe that wasn't quite an area in which he felt comfortable. But eventually he became one of the great leaders of recent Georgia history. Some of these guys for 2018 I think could travel down the same path. And as we uh, get ready to wrap up here on uh, Dog Nation Daily presented by Marco's Pizza today, we had some fun at the Florida Gators expense off the top of the show, and somebody in one of the comment sections says I was sort of the uh, OG Gator hater, and I take that as a, a huge compliment in our buddy eddie here takes that as a, a tremendous compliment as well for those of you listening on audio eddie is our mascot for uh, the program every day with his blind squirrel uh, uh blindfold in reference to dan mullen's original comment about georgia's sec championship from a year ago but speaking of mullen and those lousy stinking gators 186 days from right now we think that georgia's going back to jackson the world's largest outdoor cocktail party and getting another win it's our gator Hater countdown and we do it every day Speaking of ESPN analysts, which I mentioned a moment ago, what they sort of said weighing in on the Tennessee quarterback situation, 
There was also Greg McElroy on the Feinbaum show this week saying that he thinks that Justin Fields will take meaningful snaps for Georgia in 2018. Meaningful snaps, kind of an interesting phrase. We'll deal with that more throughout the week and see you tomorrow, Dog Nation Daily, presented by Marco's Pizza. And for those of you on video right now, thanks for being with us. we got a pretty good block of time here for some comments. I'll look forward to getting um, getting a few of these. Let me pull up the Twitter feed here, too, for a second. I, I hope you noticed. I'm trying to, when I can, mix some comments into the regular broadcast. That's a little tricky just given the fact that we got a lot of ground we got to cover during a regular day, and you know, I don't have anybody else sitting here with me, so uh, it's sort of hard to talk and read comments at the same time. But I mixed a couple of those in today. I was actually pretty pretty pleased with a, being able to squeeze a couple of those in here. All right, so let me pull up the uh, Twitter here for a moment. Uh, I'm seeing the uh, video. Some of y'all may want to beta test some comments there at some point on there just to kind of see uh, how that's all working out. Uh, over on a YouTube um Joe Self asking about the transfer uh, defensive lineman from Notre Dame, uh, Jay Hayes. So Jeff Sintel did talk about that a moment ago, and for me, I'm going to be a broken record on this. I say this all the time. I think the transfer players are a great addition to a program like Georgia because you only use the scholarship for one year. You know, you don't have some you know long term commitment here if it's, it ends up not being a great player. And for you know for Kirby Smart. I mean, his track record on these sort of transfers or sort of what I think of as waiver wire additions, making them after signing day, you know, before the start of summer camp, it's been pretty good in that regard. Uh, you know, Tulsa transfer J.R. Smith, uh, or J.R. Reed, excuse me, J.R. Smith plays for the Cleveland Cavs, or at least uh, he, he did at one point. Um, uh, J.R. Reed, I mean, who would have ever thought that the, a guy you got from Tulsa was going to be a starter at safety? That was one of those deals where, you know, Kirby Smart's talent evaluation proved to be pretty accurate on that. Uh, Brian Herring wasn't a transfer, but he was a guy that I'll admit I'd never heard of when uh, when uh, Georgia added him before the start of the 2016 season. I mean, Herring again on G-Day showed you he's pretty good. Some of y'all have been a little critical of a guy like Tyler Catalina. That's another graduate transfer that Georgia added that was Georgia's starting left tackle and plays in the NFL now. And you may say, well, Catalina didn't have quite as good a gear at Georgia as I would like for him to have. Some of you would say that. But where would Georgia have been without him? Transfer players have been good for Georgia, which is to say nothing of like a guy like Mo Smith, who was Georgia's defensive MVP in 2016. So, um, yeah, my ears perk up when I hear about a guy that, you know, is good enough to earn a scholarship at a place like Notre Dame and looking for a new home now at a position where Georgia really needs it. I, I take that really seriously, really seriously. Also, um, Nakia Hester here on YouTube saying um, – about Tyler Simmons, that I've been really high on him since day one. I think he's going to be great this season. I mean, I'll, you can go back and watch uh, one of those videos that we posted from Dog Nation Appreciation. Terrence Edwards was high on Simmons there that day for sure. I saw him Simmons play a lot at high school once he transferred over to a McEachern, and uh, he was good, uh, no doubt about that. Willie McGuire says, talent can evolve into leadership. Players tend to follow great players. Um, uh, yeah, so – I think that's probably true as well that, you know, you heard Kirby mention some of those candidates to potentially emerge as leaders. And I think at a certain point in time, that evolution is going to take place over here. Um, Matthew McGahey, who I did get a chance to uh, meet on uh, Saturday, says, B.A., so happy I got to meet you and Jeff on Saturday, daily, daily. That was a really cool thing to meet so many of you. And I'm really behind on my Twitter uh, messages. Uh, I just have not had a lot of time to be on Twitter as of late. But I, I do want to go back and uh, respond to so many of you who were kind enough to mention uh, getting a chance to see us on Saturday. It was great to see so many of you. Um, Miriam Martin Corbin says, Sintel saying we're going to be number two. Uh, number two on on whom there, uh, Marion? That's probably in reference to somebody else. Uh, Eric Moody says, "Ba, today's my forty fifth birthday, and all I want is a shout out from Eddie." But you know what, uh, Eric? Here it is. Happy forty fifth from Eddie. Um, Eddie would love would love to wish you happy birthday there on that uh, regard. Terrence Eberhardt also got a chance to meet uh, uh, Terrence as well. That was a lot of fun. Uh, Daniel Goldsmith says that. Uh, uh, Tyler Simmons, J.J. Holloman, both going to have some moments sprinkled in this year. Yeah, I was actually kind of, I hate to pat myself on the back for this, but Kirby Smart on Saturday actually made a point that was almost exactly what I made on, on uh, Dog Nation Daily at one point in time. That when Kirby was saying good things about J.J. Holloman on special teams, I said myself that you could probably draw a line between if you're contributing on special teams, you're going to earn some favor that maybe gets you in the wide receiver mix. And Kirby Smart said, 
virtually the same thing on Saturday, slightly different way, saying that you know confidence gained by contributing on special teams makes you a better wide receiver. That's just sort of a different way of phrasing what I think the point that I made was in which I took it as a good sign for Holloman as wide receiver that Kirby Smart was saying nice things about him on special teams. So, yeah, I mean, I think that Holloman you know, got a good-looking physique, you know, a big guy, showed some athleticism a year ago during G-Day. I think that Holloman's got a chance here to, to, to be a contributor. Jay Wise uh, also says that that real game day atmosphere for G-Day sort of helps create those leadership roles. I, I think that's probably right. I think it's as accurate a dress rehearsal as you're capable of having. Hayes Calloway, who's a, a buddy of ours, comes to a lot of our Dog Nation events, says, can we get DJ Shockley on the show? So DJ's been on a bunch. I tried to get DJ on not too long ago, and for whatever reason, uh, schedules just couldn't be lined up, wasn't able to be done. But, yeah, sometime this summer, I'd love to have DJ on the show for sure. Joel Moody says, doesn't the, only the top 20 recruits from a school factor into its ranking? My understanding here is that when it comes to, you know, your your current ranking in the 20, you know, 4-7 composite, that's based on the total, you know, score of all your current commits. That's why having more commits, even lower rated commits, helps you climb the recruiting rankings because at this, you know, stage of the game, you know, not everybody's got the double-digit recruit. So if you've got a lot of commits, you're going to climb the recruiting rankings. Ultimately, though, the ranking is based on the total score of the players that you sign. And obviously 300 and above is sort of that magic number to be in competition for that number one ranking but i'm also not an expert at stuff like that jason hover says ba did you catch ucf unveiling their 2017 national champions lettering on their stadium it's hilarious yeah i, I think it's hilarious and i was actually going to mention this at one point during the regular broadcast i just didn't have time what i also think is hilarious is how many alabama players take the bait on this subject and are like responding to UCF on Twitter, which is exactly what the Knights want here. This is exactly what UCF wanted. You know, it has been sort of mockingly said they have no trophy for their national championship. Their trophy is the fact that Alabama keeps talking about them. You know, what their point would be is we want a game with a team like Alabama. Well, when Alabama keeps sort of, you know, beefing back with UCF, the only Next step, logical, seems that they should play at some point in time. Alabama, in talking so much about UCF, and there's some trash being talked on Twitter even today from Alabama fans who've gotten their national championship rings about being the real national champions. You know, some of y'all on SEC Country Live make fun of me for this phrase, but I think this is an apt phrase in this case. You do not beef down. If you are Alabama, you do not have a Twitter beef with lowly UCF. You're only legitimizing them in the uh, process here, you're making yourself seem at the same level of UCF, which is raising their level and lowering yours. You're diminished by by the act here. So um, what I think is partially funny about this is how upset Alabama seems to be be about it all. They've clearly been drawn off sides here, and it's frankly unbecoming of a team that's supposed to be all about the process and, you know, you know to use Kirby Smart's phrase, keeping the main thing the main thing. Boy, Alabama has had its head all over the place this offseason. Barbershop shows and feuds with UCF and, you know, Jalen Hurts' dad. This is not a very process-oriented offseason th thus far from Alabama. Have not talked quarterbacks today, so let, 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 let's let Kyle Norton change that, who says, I love Fromm, but you got to play Fields. He's a different animal, especially with his scrambling abilities. He would have scored a few extra touchdowns at the quarterback to run with the ball. I completely agree with you about the last part of that. I thought the Fields got jobbed by the referees a couple times. And Kirby Smart did have an explanation for this about how that when the, the G-Day style sack where you like sort of run by and just sort of like swoop a guy with your hand and it's essentially one hand touch. The reason why they are very liberal about calling those a sacks is because there's a tendency for some players to grab the jersey. You know, you run by and you like grab the jersey. That's a good way to break a collarbone. And so that's why they have the very liberal sack rule here. But come on. I mean, um, you know, you're not bringing Justin Fields down that way. He'd give you that one head fake, and he's going to put somebody on the ground. Um, so he definitely could have gained some more rushing yards on Saturday. But, you know, my feeling on Jake Fromm is, is, is not really going to change here too much on just the basis of G-Day. There's too much of a track record in place for Fromm. Saturday was not a good day for him. But there is too much of a track record of good days, consecutive good days, Saturday after Saturday in the fall of 2017, that he's still my starting quarterback for right now. Now, the phrase from Greg McElroy that we referenced at the end of the show, meaningful snaps, 
yeah, I, I guess I probably would like to see Fields get a meaningful snap or two during the 2018 season. I think he's too good to be sitting on the bench. He's certainly too good to a uh, red shirt here. But I don't think this is a controversy, and really right now I'm not even sure it's it's as much of a competition as, as maybe some in the media want to suggest it is. I think that Georgia's got a starting quarterback cemented in that position given his experience, and Georgia's got a very capable backup who – is pushing for playing time apart from Fromm because of just how special of a athletic specimen he, he might be. Um, I think having good players is not a bad thing, and I think that Georgia's situation with the quarterbacks is, is not a bad thing right now. Marcus uh, Simmons says, B, I have been telling you this. So uh, I don't know what that's in reference to, but Marcus um, uh, uh, was telling me that, that he was correcting me on something, which is, listen, I need that, y'all. I mean, how many mistakes do I make in the course of a given day? Yesterday, for goodness sakes, I said that my name was Dog Nation Daily. So, yeah, uh, I need Marcus and everybody else paying very close attention, correcting me on all kinds of stuff all the time. So I appreciate all of that. Uh, Daniel Rigdon says, I thought the first string defense looked great, but depth is a concern. What are your thoughts? I think that you've got, um, I think that you've got a lot of potential linebackers. I think you've got some real depth concern along the defensive line and um, and probably in the secondary as well. I think that you've got a group of starters that you feel really good about with the defensive line. Obviously, you know, Rochester and Tyler Clark and, you know, Jonathan Ledbetter, that sort of classic three-man front for the for the base 3-4 defense. Daquan Hawkins-Muckle rotating in there and I guess really even getting some first-team reps over, over Tyler Clark from time to time depending on what kind of – you know what kind of offense you're trying to stop on a you know, on a given day. That's a pretty good group of four, probably. Beyond that, you don't really know yet. You'd love to see Mikel Carter step up in a big way. You'd love to see you know Devontae Wyatt be ready to go. I'm curious about how a uh, a Notre Dame transfer could potentially factor into all that kind of discussion. Um, yeah, you like all of that, uh, but depth there is clearly a concern, and the same thing's true with the secondary. If you tell me your starters, J.R. Reed as a safety, I saw him last year. I feel good about him. Richard LeCount, I'm incredibly confident about you know LeCount's ability to be a um, a, a really good starter. Uh, DeAndre Baker showed again on Saturday why he was potentially a high draft pick this spring if he'd chosen to come out, and maybe even a higher draft pick uh, next year in the uh, it will be the spring of 2019. There at that point in time, I'm excited about Tyson Campbell. I'm hopeful about the return of D'Angelo Gibbs. Beyond that, though, your depth at secondary probably a little concerning as well. So to the commenter, I think it's all fair. All fair. Um, Nick Lurch in the comment section. I, I met Nick on Saturday, too. That was kind of a cool moment. Um, so I met a lot of y'all on Saturday. It was really fun. Really fun. I, I had a great time. You, you know, I, I, what Kirby said yesterday was so appropriate. What he said on Saturday, we played it yesterday, so appropriate. Like, who wouldn't want to come, you know, pretty day in Athens, you know, bring the family out. I didn't get to bring my family. but but I would have loved to have and just hang out with a bunch of Georgia fans, a lot of, you know, listeners and viewers to the show. It was, it was great. It was great. Alan Verbronchik says, I do not put a lot of stock in what I see during a glorified practice like the G day game. It is fair to say that, that G day can lead you down towards some false positives. In other words, what you see may not actually prove what you think it does. That's probably a fair caveat. I think one of the reasons why we break down G day. So, um, aggressively is because it's just fun to talk about it but yeah there is there is an element in which it can be a little misleading let me go back to youtube for a moment i haven't been there in a while um canaan bird who i read from a little earlier says uh how long does it take fields who's probably more talented to win the job if rom keeps winning yeah i think that you know what that question sort of references is the idea that the competition between Fromm and Fields is the kind of thing that would last more than one year. And I, I think that it could. And over the course of time, you know, you may see, you know, different leaders from time to time. You know, you may see, you know, a, a, a streak of time in which, you know, Fromm is the upper hand, a streak of time in which Fields has the upper hand. But ultimately for right now, because of the winning and because of the success that uh, Fromm had, he is the starting quarterback. Y'all know I like, you know, pro wrestling and you know, I love the old Ric Flair phrase of to be the man, you gotta beat the man. And in the case of you know the quarterback competition here, to unseat a starting quarterback, there's gotta be a good reason to do that. You know, he's gotta be either out outplayed during practice or or, you know, a door's gotta be open because of some ineffective play during a game. 
if if Jake Fromm were to have moments during the 2018 season like he had on Saturday, at that point in time, you might talk a, a little bit more about that. But the odds are, for me, I just have confidence in Fromm and that's not going to happen. So the decision to play Fields, I don't think comes at the expense of Fromm. You play him because you're seeing independent of Fromm things from Fields that are good enough that he's got to be on the field. But I just, I just think, that, I think that Fromm is probably too good to open the door for Fields too much on that. Alexander uh, Rain, uh, I hope I pronounced Alexander's last name correctly. It could be, I guess, Rainey, uh, says, I love Fromm, but Justin's a beast. I don't know how long can Jake can stay in front. You know, I don't think any of us know how this is going to play out. There, There's an element of mystery involved in, 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 in a, a lot of this, but, um, but just because we don't know how it's going to play out doesn't mean that it's going to play out negatively for Georgia or any of these two quarterbacks. There is a very... A very narrow needle that can be thread here where it actually sort of works out on all sides. Now, we'll see if that actually ends up happening that way, but it's at least a possibility. We're certainly going to talk a lot about that over the course of the offseason, and we're glad that you're here with us to do that. Love to have you join me at 3 p.m. Eastern time this afternoon for SEC Country Live, SEC Country Facebook, YouTube, and our Twitter pages for uh, that. Just at SEC Country on all of those uh, various channels, you can check us out. We'll have the audio version of this show up right away, podcast form, and then on the radio later on today as well for those of you in Athens. But podcast coming up here really soon, wherever you find your podcast. And then we're back to more morning. 10 a.m., and we'll do it all off-season long because uh, we can't wait for the fall to get here. It's another episode of Dog Nation Daily Live. It's presented by Marco's Pizza, and as I said, we'll see you at 10 a.m. Y'all have a great day, and we'll talk to you soon.